Amen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lake. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church in Bartow. We are gathered together. Even though we are scattered, we are joined by the Holy Spirit. And this is the time for us to rejoice and celebrate victory over death. Just a few announcements. Tomorrow, Monday at 10 a.m. via Zoom, we're going to have our prayer meeting. If you want to join in, please email Cynthia, our secretary, and she will give you all the details. On Wednesday at 6.57 or 7 p.m., we're going to go live with our, with our Bible study. For that, you will need to tune in to my personal Facebook or uh, to the church's Facebook page. We will try to have it there too this time. And then finally, uh, we will continue to worship on uh, Facebook on Sundays at 1027, just as we're doing today. The Lord is risen. Let us celebrate and let us worship him from our hearts because the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Hallelujah.
If you have a hymn book at home, we invite you for the call to worship to go to Psalm 150, which is found on page 862. It's a psalm of joy to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise God in his mighty firmament. Praise God for his mighty deeds. Praise God for his exceeding greatness. Praise God with trumpet sound. Praise God with lute and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with sounding cymbals. Praise God with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And now, as the psalm says, everything that breathes, praise the Lord. Let us pray. God, we worship you with joy. We feel you in our hearts. You are going to appear to us today just as you did to the women and to the disciples, even though they were doubting. God, forgive our doubts and show up today to your church. We are in need of you, God. We dedicate this worship service to you, like you did to Thomas, God. Show up to us and let us see your wounds, but also let us see your face of victory as you now go into the glory with the Father. We praise you, God, in your name. Amen. Let us now go to the Lord with our joys and our concerns. Let's pray together. Father, on a beautiful day like this, when we celebrate your victory over death and uh, sin, when we praise your name and we worship you for your goodness and your mercies, yes, we God. just come Amen. together in agreement to lift up the concerns that are in our hearts and the joys uh, as we see your hand at work. Amen. We rejoice in Amen. your healing power being manifested in Manolo. And we just give you thanks, Father, for your, what you have done. And as we continue Amen. to pray for those who are in yes, need of your healing touch in our congregation, and we find ourselves in at times that we don't, don't even know how to ask. Yes, God. We trust in your Holy Spirit, 
who intercedes for us in our Amen. supplication. Yes. And we come together, Lord Jesus, in this day to praise you and to give you thanks for what you have done once again, what you are doing and what you will do to complete your work in Amen. our midst. Yes, God. God, we, we thank you for being with us and we thank you for the power of the resurrection that gives us hope for the victory over everything, God. Now we also lift up to you with gratitude our, our joys. We thank you because uh, Pat Half is going to be turning 90 on the 15th on Wednesday and, and he is such a blessing to the church and to Barto. We thank you for him and we pray that he will have the best birthday we thank you for others that we will be celebrating their birthday this week, for Wayne Snell on the 12th, for Kaylee Coyle. Uh, thank you, God, because she is growing up in the church and she is looking your face, and we pray that you will always show up to her and she will know you intimately, God. We thank you for Cody Vaughn, uh, whose birthday is on the 15th. And we pray also that you will protect him, God, as he goes around uh, protecting our city. Send your angel to guide him and to protect him. We thank you for Melanie Chansey, her birthday on the 16th, and Chris Chansey on the 18th, and Gary Lingle on the 18th. God, all of these birthdays, we thank you because you are with them. And we pray that they will be able to celebrate. And God... We thank you for the anniversary of Sean and Amy Fitzgerald that is coming on the 17th. They mean so much to our church and they give so much of themselves to you, to their school, their students. Help them, help them, God, to celebrate with joy with their children and with a bright look into the future. Yes. And God, we thank you for past anniversaries too. We thank you for Cliff and Jan Daniels who had their uh, anniversary on the third. Thank you for their marriage. Thank you for their children. Protect them, God, as they work around in different places. Keep them from illnesses, God. And thank you, God, for, for making us a family. Now we are separated. We are in our homes. We are distanced from each other, but we are one in you. Thank you, God. We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Our prayers help us to be able to find a spirit of worship. And in that spirit, we're going to continue by being able to join together in some praise music. Our next song, Death Was Arrested, the bridge talks about the fact that we're free. That Jesus' resurrection freed us from the slavery of death. And because of that freedom, we're able to worship God together. So I encourage you to sing with us from wherever you are, Death Was Arrested. <laughs>
just rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. For oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Oh, we're free, free forever. We're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, we're free, free forever. We're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested, my life began. When death was arrested, my life began. When death was arrested, my life
Friends, we have a blessing for you now. We have a guest preacher. Bishop Ken Carter is coming to our church electronically. Uh, so we welcome Bishop. Thank you for sharing the word with us. We're so glad you're here. Bishop Carter will preach on Easter, COVID-19, and the contradiction of the resurrection faith. His sermon will be based on Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10, which I'm going to read now. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. And behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren, my brothers and sisters, to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. The word of God for the people of God. All praise be to God. Amen. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers of the Florida Conference, in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Ken Carter. It's my honor to serve as the Bishop of the Florida Conference, and it is a particular privilege to share this Easter message with you. The title of this message is Easter COVID-19 and the Contradiction of Resurrection Faith. The law did not allow them to come to the place of his burial on the Sabbath. And so the women arrive as soon as practically possible on the first day of the week with spices to anoint his body. They expect the tomb to be closed, but it's open. And they expect to find the body, but it's not there. Understandably, Luke tells us they were perplexed, confused. In the message translation, they are puzzled. Suddenly, the women encounter two men, angels maybe, and they're terrified. Their impulse is to bow to the ground. Fear is a common thread that runs throughout the gospel accounts of the resurrection. The Greek word is phobos, from which we get our word phobia. We're told six times in the four Gospels that the witnesses to the resurrection are filled with fear. This is in part that they're disoriented in the face of this unexpected event, but it's more. It's a sense of the holy. The biblical translator Eugene Peterson connected this to the first proverb, the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Something profound is happening. In a time of radical change, everything shifts. We are appropriately fearful, and yet we are most open to transition to insight. 
God has our attention. Matthew's story that got shared about the resurrection said it was like an earthquake. God has our attention. It's a wake-up call and not simply because this is early in the morning. We're awakened of all that had come before. And this has everything to do with Good Friday. We had been living or sleepwalking through a Good Friday world. And there's this interruption, this reversal. And our response in the language of Scripture is fear of the Lord. Do not be afraid. He's not here. He's risen. The stranger goes on, why do you seek the living among the dead? Don't you remember what he taught you in Galilee? Let's pause for a moment and note the presence of women in the gospel at the resurrection in the ministry of Jesus. Luke, in his telling of the story, is careful of the details. Why? Because this is the word of God. This is promise and fulfillment. Luke gives us the names of the women. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. Earlier in this gospel, chapter 8, verse 2, we learn that the disciples are with Jesus along with the women who had been recipients of his healing ministry. And they're also named Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna, and many others. It's essential to note that women were in the inner circle of Jesus' disciples from the very beginning. They were present as Jesus taught the disciples. They were engaged in every important act of his ministry. They were present at his crucifixion. They followed his body as it was taken to the tomb. And they are with him on the first Easter. A fascinating aside. In this time and place, women were not deemed trustworthy to testify in court. More than one scholar has noted that it would have been hard to imagine why a writer would have women discovering the empty tomb unless that is what actually happened. And because they had been with him all along, the women remembered it helps that Jesus is a master teacher. Think of his two best known parables, the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son. In the first story, a man is beaten, a Samaritan shows compassion, the man is healed. In the second story, a child is lost, and in returning home, he's embraced by the parent, the child is restored. These parables prepare us for an even more crucial story. A good man, a righteous man is executed. He is dead, he's buried. But when they go to care for him, he's not there. He has been raised from the dead. At the heart of these teachings lies a contradiction. Something happens that we were not expecting. For the women on the first Easter, it was a puzzle and it remains so for many of us to this day. To observe Easter in the midst of a global pandemic is a contradiction. This is not how we expected to celebrate Easter. In Holy Week, we reflected on the importance of the cross and on Good Friday in many churches, we would traditionally drape the cross, a, a symbol of death. On this Easter morning, we celebrate the assurance of life in the midst of death, even the victory of life over death. All of this, in the words of Parker Palmer, is a dynamic contradiction. Parker, Parker Palmer writes, the cross represents the way in which the world contradicts God. 
We yearn for light and truth and goodness to appear among us. And when they come in human form, the world grows fearful and kills the incarnation. But then the cross represents the way in which God contradicts the world. No matter how often the world says no, God is present with an eternal yes, bringing light out of darkness, hope out of despair, life out of death. He is not here. He is risen. We see the continuity of the cross through the entire life and ministry of Jesus. We see the arms of the cross reaching down to heal the wounded man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. Are we providing the care in that story or are we being made well? We feel the arms of the cross embracing the rebellious child. Are those our arms or are, are those the arms of someone else enfolding us? We hear the teacher's voice saying to the criminal, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Saying about the enemies, Father, forgive them. What do these stories, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, the Resurrection, have in common? They enlarge our worlds. They expand our minds. They extend our reach into the lives of others. They reject our tendency to flatten the world and our experience of it. The man walking from Jerusalem to Jericho is beaten, wounded, left for dead. The religious people pass by on the other side. Death is a part of life. The son, far from home, squanders his birthright, defaces his identity, identity, that child is lost. A world is in the grip of a deadly virus, wreaking havoc on all of our plans, isolating us behind our locked doors, distancing us from each other. Along comes a prophet who contradicts all of this, who dreams the dream of God, a Samaritan bandages a wounded man. How unlikely. A parent embraces a rebellious child. How undignified. A discredited rabbi hangs on a cross. How scandalous. Where is all of this going? Embedded in these stories is a power, a power to heal. We need that story of a power to heal to reconcile, to roll away the stone, to bring life out of death. This master rabbi kept hinting at all of this, but our hearts couldn't absorb it. Our minds couldn't imagine it. Yes, he told us about all of this. Now that we think about it, now, looking back, we remember. And so they go to share the good news with others because you cannot keep a good story to yourself. They go first to the authority figures, the apostles. You think the apostles, all men will believe the witnesses, all women? No, you would be right. It could be male chauvinism or insider arrogance, but it could also be that they do not believe because this has not yet been their experience. Paul, writing to some of the first followers of Jesus, asked, How can you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If Christ has not been raised, our preaching's in vain, our faith is in vain. We're not telling the truth about God or ourselves. I'm aware that there are persons beyond the church and sometimes inside of it for whom the resurrection is something they can't quite figure out. It's just not within their belief structure or experience. 
Again, Parker Palmer tells the story of Lauren Isley, who was a renowned naturalist who once spent time in a seaside town. He was plagued by insomnia. He couldn't sleep very well, and so he would spend the very early morning hours walking on the beach. Each morning at sunrise, he would observe the townspeople combing the sand for starfish, which were washing ashore during the night, and they were gathering them for commercial purposes. For Lauren Isley, this was a sign, a small sign, of the way the world often says no to God's gift of life. But one morning, Isley got up as unusually early and discovered a solitary figure on the beach. This man, too, was gathering starfish, but each time he would pick one up, he would throw it out as far as he could into the breaking surf, back into the nurturing ocean from which it came. As the days went by, Isley found this man embarked on his mission of mercy every morning, seven days a week, no matter the weather. Isley named this man the Star Thrower, and he would later confess that this man and his pre dawn work contradicted everything Isley had been taught and believed about evolution and the survival of the fittest. Here on the beach, the strong reached down to save, not to crush, the weak. And this led Lauren Isley, who was not a believer, to wonder, is there a star thrower at work in the universe? Is there a God who contradicts death? That's the Easter question. Is there a God who contradicts death? That's the COVID-19 question. Is there a God who contradicts death? Christians, by definition, are people who have experienced the resurrection. In some way or another, we have discovered that the tomb is empty. In some way or another, we have met the risen Lord. In some way or another, we've chosen life and not death. It's something of a puzzle sometimes, or a wake-up call, or a leap of faith. Sometimes it evokes a, a sense of danger or fear. We're letting go of something. We're in a process of healing. Maybe we started, have started walking back home toward our true purpose, and we're living in the implications of what this means. Words of Ken Callahan, hope is stronger than memory. Salvation is stronger than sin. Forgiveness is stronger than bitterness. Reconciliation is stronger than hatred. Resurrection is stronger than crucifixion. Light is stronger than darkness. And so today, Christians across this troubled planet celebrate, remember, bear witness to this experience, the resurrection of Jesus. It's a contradiction. And like the apostles at the beginning, there are many within and outside the church who can't quite believe it. And yet when Christians gather together, we are in a mystical sense, we are the risen body of Christ. Paul, writing later to the Corinthians in words we've read at the graveside, expresses it. It is sown a mortal body, it is raised a spiritual body. Through baptism, we die to self, and we're raised into a new life. Through communion, we eat the meal and come, become for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Through service, we participate in the great mission of mercy, reclaiming a starfish here and a starfish there. Through study and worship, what we're doing right now, 
we tell these stories, the same stories, over and over again. Stories about healing and reconciliation and eternity. About what it means to love our neighbor. What it means to be family. And finally, what it means to trust the promises of God. We are the Easter people. We are the people of hope. We are the star throwers. And we believe with all our hearts and minds that there is at the heart of the universe a God who contradicts death. This is the good news for us, the Easter people, in this year of COVID-19, on this Easter Sunday, 2020. He is not here. He is risen. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bishop Carter, for that inspiring sermon. We really appreciate you coming today. Now we're going to sing our closing hymn, hymn 310, He Lives. Church, he lives. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Now go into the world with that joy. The power of the Lord, which overcomes everything, even death and coronavirus, is with us today and forevermore. So the blessing from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is with you now and forevermore. And the people of God at home say, Amen.
Happy Easter. Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed.